so the carbon footprint of everything. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the point of the book and uh, you know, why I wrote it and what it's trying to do and how it's trying to do it and why it's trying to do it. And then uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's uh, actually in the book and some of the, some of the footprints um, in it. So uh, the start point really is the you know, three basic assumptions. And I don't really debate these at length in the book. Just take it that you've, um, it's really written uh, with, with the assumption that we, you know, we've, we've got to this point. Climate change is uh, it's a big deal, it's man-made, and we can do something about it. And just very briefly to comment, you know, what's interesting about this is that whilst the science is, you know, is really settled on the first two points, the interesting thing is that you know, as society, we're still managing to give you know, huge traction to um, climate change denial. And, uh, and the psychological process of how we uh, respond to this is kind of, on the one hand, really fascinating, and on the other hand, kind of quite frustrating and dangerous. Which kind of makes the, the third point down there, in a way, possibly um, the most debatable. You know, are we? Is our, is our species actually capable of getting itself uh, off its butt and, res and responding to this um, properly? And I'll, I will just mention, uh, sometimes people, uh, you know, I, I work with a lot of businesses who say, uh, well, you know, it's not really up to us to move on this because it all depends on our, on our customers. You know, we just have to follow up what our customers want. And, and, uh, you know, and then you get politicians saying, well, they're responding to their electorate. And consumers who are saying, you know, and, you know us in the public, we're saying, well, you know, we can't, I, I hear people saying, well, we can't do anything until the government does something and we're in the hands of the businesses and so on. And actually, you know, we're all in a system. And uh, you don't shift a system by um, just one little piece of it. So you know, anyone, anywhere, in any context, any, and any organisation, in any country, you know, can be a really helpful part in, um, you know, in, in moving that system on um, a little bit. So it's a, but it's a pretty tricky challenge. I just put this this slide up because. Um, uh, you know, I think we've got pretty good at uh, understanding our really direct impacts, the stuff that goes on in front of our eyes. And you know, we got our heads around this when we were when we were cavemen, or probably before that. Um, and if anyone punched anyone else in the in the face in this room right now, I think we'd all have a very strong emotional reaction to it. But um, on the other hand, if you look at the you know, picture on the right-hand side, you know, we do all that kind of stuff. And in doing that, it's, you know, what the impact of that is not going on in front of our eyes. It's, it's actually triggering, uh, you know, in order to do all that shopping, um, things have to go on all around the world with all kinds of implications. They're very hard to work out what has to go on. And it's even hard to, to work out what the impacts are going to be. And even harder again um, to work out uh, what the impact on quality of life might be. Um, and even when you've done all of that, it's even harder uh, again to get up, to get the kind of emotional response to it that we might need to start having in order to manage it. Um, but here we are in global society, and the impacts of what we do doesn't anymore uh, go on just in front of our nose. It goes on uh, all around the world. Uh, that shopping, or you know, getting on an airplane for a family holiday, or whatever it is. Um, uh, the, the impact is likely to be dispersed over 7 billion people in some way and over, over several decades and so on. And somehow we need to get to the point where we, we understand enough about what it is that we can manage it and we, are we, we respond to it emotionally enough that um, we, can, um, we can start managing it. Uh, and that's probably, uh, you know, the jury's out over whether we're, whether we're capable perhaps. So one way of looking at it is that we need a kind of instinct for this carbon. Um, in the same way that we've got a kind of instinct for money, uh, more or less. So, you know, it doesn't have to be exact. It doesn't, you know, that's the good news, is it doesn't need to be exact. But it does need to be good enough. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you want to buy, if you're walking down the street and you want to buy a cup of tea, you kind of know that you can, it's not going to break the bank, but you probably wouldn't just buy a, a house, most of us, on the, on, the, on the spur of a moment like that. And we've kind of got the orders of magnitude in place. And that's all the book's trying to do, really. It's trying to get the orders of magnitude in, the place, in place. And... Um, you know, the, the, su the supply chains I've been talking about, you know, what goes on behind the shopping or, uh, and so on, are incredibly complex and we, you know, we can't bottom them out. We can't get an, um, an exact uh, picture of them at all. But we can uh, get um, a better picture than nothing. We can get the zeros in the right place most of the time. And actually, you know, that's good enough to begin being sensible in the way that we um, treat the issues. So uh, you know, I think of the book as just a very early, um, just a very early map. Uh, if it's designed 
the, the intention is that uh, it puts in place, you know, carbon impacts about everything that you do and think about it by b that you do and think about by talking through kind of a hundred or so um, things. And the idea is that having talked through how they get to have their carbon footprints and roughly what those carbon footprints are, you get an understanding of what the carbon footprint of absolutely anything and anything um, you might think about could be. So uh, just about the idea of an early map, you know, if you've got a map that you know is pretty crude, and you're trying to say you're trying to sail around the world and all you've got is a map like that, uh, what would you do with it? You know, would you um, chuck it out and replace it with a very detailed map of your hometown? Um, no, because that wouldn't get you around the world. Would you uh, use it with real caution, n understanding that it's probably got all sorts of problems with it? Uh, yes. Uh, would you try and make a better one? Um, absolutely. And that's really how I um, see the book. So on to a few uh, footprint examples. Uh, so first of all, let's start off with this one. So there's, there's humankind, the world, uh, 50 billion tons or so, roughly speaking, of carbon dioxide equivalent. So you know, when I say carbon, um, we're talking about all the greenhouse gases rolled into one expresses carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2e. And uh, I'll just mention whilst I'm here that in all the sums I've, I've got in, in the book, um, there's a markup factor for aviation, because although we don't exactly know how much uh, more impact high altitude emissions have, we know that they um, do have a higher impact. So I, I use a, about a 1.9 um, markup. Uh, so there's the world. And uh, there we go. There's a UK person coming in at about uh, 15 tons. And uh, that includes all the stuff that uh, he does and buys. Uh, and it does include, critically, things that he uses and buys that are made overseas and are uh, imported um, into the UK. So there he is. And we can sort of speculate on whether his lifestyle is higher or lower than the 15 tons. Uh, we do vary enormously. But if he was absolutely typical, um, excuse a busy, a busy chart coming up now, but he'd look something, uh, he'd look something like this. So I'll just sort of briefly talk through some of that. So the uh, household fuel is the blue one up here, uh, thirteen percent. So that's um, that's mainly your, your gas bill uh, for most of us. Uh, household vehicle fuel, ten percent. That's um, the bit that comes out of the exhaust pipe, the exhaust pipe of your car, plus. Um, all the supply chains uh, of digging that fuel out of the ground and shipping it around the world and refining it and so on, which is about uh, about a quarter or so of that 10% is those supply chains. Then you've got household electricity at just 9%, the bit we kind of all hear about the most in our, you know, in our, uh, as, as individuals. Um, next on down the list is what I think is uh, pretty surprising for most people, is personal air travel in this country, that's looking at 8%. So I have, I have included um, that markup factor of 1.9 that I told you about, which I think uh, is a pretty clear case for including. But on the other hand, what I haven't included in that 8% is any business travel or any air freight. That's just people flying for personal reasons. If you do include those things, flying in the UK comes up to something like 12% of the UK's consumption footprint, which is uh, pretty often understated. Um, it's partly because we're an island, and uh, it's very hard to go in one direction without, without getting on an aeroplane. That's partly because we're rich and developed. Uh, so, so moving around a little bit for personal transport. Um, next one, this orange one down there, cars at 5%. That's the cars themselves. That's the manufacture and maintenance of cars themselves. So when you're driving, it's not just, the, uh, it's not just what comes out of your exhaust pipes, the manufacture of the cars as well. Next on round, almost the biggest chunk in the pie, that, that, that blue one down there, food and drink, that's at 12%, and that's only the bit that we buy from shops. So uh, it doesn't include anything you buy here in the RSA, anything you buy in a hotel, a pub, a restaurant, or any of that other food that you might buy from a business. Uh, if you do include that, you get up to about 20%-ish for food and drink. Um, and that's in a, using an analysis that doesn't factor in deforestation around the world. If you start factoring that in as well, you can get up to figures around the 30%-ish mark. So um, food, you know, definitely something uh, to have on the radar. Then there's a whole load of bits and job bobs that I won't uh, go into in, in too much detail, sort of paper and printing and 
um, electronic stuff, the buying of electronic stuff um, and appliances. Um, this up here includes the war in Iraq and you know all the, all the stuff that we do, the National Health Service, all kinds of stuff. And there's too many things in that other category to uh, even begin to mention. Um, so that's a broad picture. Uh, okay, moving on. Another, I, I put this up. The carbon footprint depends. It's sort of a kilogram or two. I didn't actually want to. Uh, the reason I put this up is just to stress at this point that we've all got plenty of um, dirty washing in our lifestyles and in our in the way that we that we live. And so the book is absolutely not about beating ourselves up about this. Um, you could certainly anyone could beat me up about my lifestyle. Um, you ask my wife, you know, how squeaky clean my carbon credentials are. Uh, definitely not perfect. So, uh, so. You know, how do we respond to this thing? How do we, how do we uh, move past the kind of psychological block that makes every, uh, loads of us, most of us, disengage from the climate change agenda, really? Um, you know, it's definitely not about beating people up and, uh, and getting guilty, I don't think. Um, so I hope that frees me up to go and uh, talk about some carbon footprints, some other carbon footprints. Here's one. Um, this is London to Hong Kong uh, return. Uh, it, varies depending on how you fly and how much space you take up. Um, but that aeroplane is going to burn through something like 111 tonnes of fuel on, its, on, its each, on each trip. And it's going to uh, turn that fuel into about three times or so its weight in carbon dioxide. And all that, and all that is going to have roughly double the impact that it would have had if you just burned the fuel on the runway. Uh, so yeah, a lot more if it's first class, a little bit less if it's economy. So uh, if you think of 15 tonnes as UK average, you haven't got to do that many trips to the Far East before. That's it. You're up on your 15 tonnes. Um, here's another one. Drying your hands. I put it up because um, really for perspective. So I think one of the really important things about the book is it's important to have a sense of perspective. I, I, get a, I sometimes get asked this by you know, people who fly a lot. And... Uh, Darren Brown calls this misdirection of attention. You focus on something that really doesn't matter a hoot, and it's a way of actually not focusing on the thing you should be th thinking about. So you know, we're talking about almost a factor of mi a million here between that and that. And OK, you probably dry your hands more than you fly across the Atlantic, even if you do a lot of it. Um, but we're still talking you know, uh, many, 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 many times more important. So it's important to put the attention where it matters the most. Um, next up, you know, very similar, a plastic carrier bag. Now, plastic carrier bags are, you know, they're horrible for all sorts of reasons. They plug up our, um, you know, they plug up, uh, they plug up the seas and our landfill sites, and they choke animals and all the rest of it. And they're really nasty. From a purely carbon perspective, actually, they're not too bad. So we've, we've done a lot of work um, with a supermarket chain, Booth Supermarkets, and one of the kind of first big kind of surprise messages we gave them was that their carrier bags were something like, in broad terms, about a thousandth of their carbon footprint. So when you're walking home from the supermarket, even if you're using disposable carrier bags, you've got your shopping in your bags, something like a thousandth of the carbon footprint you're carrying up the street um, is the bags themselves, and the other 99, 999 thousandths is what's inside them. Uh, and obviously, it depends what kind of bag uh, it is. So let's have a bit of a look at what's inside those bags. Uh, this is asparagus. Uh, and on the, so obviously varies a lot. And I'll just emphasize again, all these numbers, all carbon footprint numbers are always, whatever anybody tells you, they are always really approximate. So if you see a couple of significant figures in there, really, and uh, emphasizing this, this in the book, um, you know, we just mean a range all the time. That's the best estimate with a big error margin around it. But, um, it's accurate enough to be able to see you know, very clearly that there's a massive difference between the local in-season product that tastes, I'm told, much, much nicer than the one that's air freighted from Peru, uh, and which, incidentally, is the one you can eat right now. So uh, now's the time for the asparagus. Up at the other end of the extreme, you've got uh, air freighted from Peru, um, carbon disaster area. So This is a kind of a surprise. So uh, this is based on a, some work by Cranfield University, and they're saying that actually a single red rose, out of season, hot housed in, in Holland, 2.1 kilos of carbon for that one red rose. Um, so by comparison, 
Uh, you could have four and a half kilos of bananas for that also. And uh, so that's a Valentine's Day little tip for you if you're trying to live the... Uh, trying to try out something uh, a bit new. And in fact, I do know somebody who gave their husband a bunch of bananas on Valentine's Day, and she said it, was, it went okay. She said she found a way of making it romantic, and it was a success. So there you go. <laughs> uh, but I think flowers are, are really interesting. Um, when you start to look at flowers, and when we started digging around in flowers, and you know, all that air freight, and all that hot housing, and you know, pesticide issues, and so on. And I've, I've talked to quite a few people recently who've said that kind of actually out-of-season flowers, you know, all the kind of emotional appeal that used to be around you know, that kind of thing uh, ju has just vanished for them. Because actually, once you, once, you under once you become aware of something, you sort of go through a gate that you can't go back through. That's it. You can't, you know, you can't any longer buy those flowers without thinking, um, you know, crumbs, this is what's behind it. Um, it's worth mentioning uh, Annie Leonard, who did a fantastic video, some of you undoubtedly have seen, called The, the Story of Stuff. And it's like a, just a short cartoony video about, you know, what is behind the stuff we buy in the shops. That's a brilliant video. And uh, I saw a piece of writing she did recently about what it's like for her going around the shops, and she's describing how... You know, not just in carbon terms, but she picks something up, almost anything up, and flashing before her eyes are oh, you know, all, all the supply chains behind it and all the people making this stuff and what's going on in the factories and how are the workers treated and, you know, what's going on in the... What, what's she triggering her in, in landfill sites and, um, you know, what's going on in the oceans and what's the carbon impact and what's that going to do to people around the world and all the rest of it. And actually, that, you know, that's, that's perfect. That's the kind of instinct if we're going to live well in a global society. Somehow, we're going to need to get to that kind of understanding built, you know, built into ourselves. Um, so that's, uh, that's the red rose. Daffodils, what about that for a, for a Valentine's idea? Um, just move on, just w sticking with the sort of foodie and grown stuff and uh, that's kind of consumables theme. Just to mention, um, there's, there's a burger and uh, the big deal in that is clearly the meat and uh, however sort of comfortable or uncomfortable this is in the Western world, you know, uh, meat is, a, is quite an ineff inefficient way of getting our nutrition, and if we get it from ruminant animals like cows or sheep, it's about doubly inefficient again. And there just isn't any escaping the fact that it's, you know, it's quite a high-carbon, high-impact way of living, and it triggers all kinds of deforestation um, as well. Uh, but there is some good news about that, is that most of us here in the developed world would actually probably live a bit longer if, uh, if we had a bit less of it. So, uh, which kind of reminds me that I wanted to say that you know, in terms of what we should do about this, you know, it's, there's an awful lot to be had uh, just by sort of asking questions, I think, about you know, how we live and the assumptions about how we should have to live and actually cutting out some of the stuff in our lives that uh, actually adds absolutely nothing whatever to the quality of our lives. And um, you know, we're all different for what kind of stuff that is. Um, and it might be that you know, it's burgers or it might be that it's... Um, you know, flying places uh, for experiences where you had, when you get there, actually, you just try and have the most similar experience you can to you can have to being at home or whatever. You know, and actually, you maybe you could have a you know a two day longer holiday if you just stayed local. Or you know, we've all got different junk, but it's about trying to try. You know, part of the battle is about uh, trying to identify it and cut it out. Okay, uh, moving on to a bit about transport. So this is London to Glasgow return. Um, the bike wins if you're powered by bananas. Um, so, <laughs> just this isn't this isn't, uh, uh, but it doesn't win if you're powered by Peruvian asparagus. That would be a pretty interesting experiment trying to cycle London to Glasgow eating only asparagus. But, um, but just to make the point, you know, as long as you eat sensible food and that's actually the stuff that you'll enjoy cycling with um, a lot more. The thing, the high carbohydrate stuff uh, would be is great. Uh, Train comes out second best in that analysis. Uh, interesting, actually, train could come out a lot better if it went a little bit slower. And also, if, um, I was, there's a professor at Lancaster who's studied this in detail, and he, re he reckons that our trains are about at least twice as heavy as they need to be because we've got so paranoid about safety that they've been just massively over-engineered for safety. And despite the fact that they are hugely safer than... Um, than driving, just massively safer than driving. You know, we're still paranoid about the, the safety of them. So the train could be better than that. 
I'll just briefly mention Eurostar. Uh, it doesn't really make much difference whether um, it's a country that's got a lot of nuclear power in it or not. The sensible way of thinking about that is the marginal demand. So if Eurostar lays on another train, then uh, it doesn't. France doesn't up its nuclear capacity um, to respond to that. Actually, what happens is that someone, somewhere in Europe, a coal power station is going to put more coal in um, to meet that extra demand. So the, it's the marginal demand that is it's, it's, um, more useful to think in terms of. Um, so driving. Driving could be better than flying. Depends on how you drive, of course, and how many people in the car. You can obviously make a, uh, a big improvement um, getting more people in the car. We did a few sums looking at uh, time and carbon and cost and so on against different ways of doing this journey. And the interesting thing, one of the interesting things was that um, you know the train, the train ride wins hands down because you don't waste, you hardly waste any time because you can chill out on the train and do work and so on. Um, and when you're doing the analysis over the car journey, as well as the fact that it's kind of all dead time and you're just not doing anything other than driving, probably, or you might be doing a bit. But if you factor in um, the possibility that you lose a lot of time by actually dying um, in a car crash, if you factor in that times the probability it happens, um, you have to add about an hour to or so to each journey. Uh, <laughs> I just mentioned this, um, you know, very crude numbers, of course, um, but just to, just, to, just to bring up the area of you know, the carbon footprint of stuff that we buy. And there's this laptop, and it looks like a pretty small thing. And actually, it's got all sorts of components that have been made in very high-tech, um, incredibly pure conditions, and so on. And best estimates through either a sort of process lifecycle analysis approach that Apple have done in detail, or, or an input-output approach, or whatever, you come in at figures around that sort of mark, and sort of somewhere up to a ton-ish kind of mark. And uh, interesting about that is that unless you really use your computer a lot uh, and keep it on all night, every night, and so on, um, the embodied energy, the embodied carbon in the machine itself, is likely to be uh, a bigger deal than the power that it uses over its over its lifetime. And that is, you know, in the scheme of 15 tons a year, that's you know, that's quite a that's quite a big um, chunk of carbon. Whilst we're on IT stuff, so data centers. So this is one of those sort of real surprises for me. So this is estimates of the world's data centers and taking it up to 2020. So we're getting up to about a, this is kind of um, a quarter of a, uh, sorry, half a percent plus of the world's, uh, mankind's carbon footprint. Um, and, uh, and on top of that, there's people at their sort of terminal, you know, people at their computer end and all the power that they're using and stuff. So there are other bits to add to it. So although, you know, a bit of, um, the you know, uh, information age is it's a very efficient way of doing a bit of a bit of data. Our data demands have got dramatically higher. So you know, a few years back, if I wanted to go for a book, if I wanted to uh, you know get hold of a book, I'd go down the road to the bookshop, and if it was lunch hour, I might expect a queue to talk to a, 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 a shop assistant maybe, and after a while, we might browse through a few thousand books, and I might you know, I might get to my my ch you know see if my book is amongst the few thousand in the bookshop. Now Amazon's got a meter demand that even if it's peak time. I can browse the world's published materials in two seconds or something. So you know our our, um, our, our demands have got so much higher that it's not necessarily uh, such a low carbon thing. And so paper, for comparison, paper's only ever been about one percent of the UK's carbon footprint. Um, and now we're doing paper and we're doing the digital stuff, so we're kind of having both. And it's just one example of a rebound effect where you, we, do, we find a way of doing something more efficiently, and because it's more efficient, we go and do tons and tons more of it, and because we do so much more of it, we might end up with uh, a bigger impact than we, than we had in the first place. So Tim Jackson does a really good job of flushing out that um, in his book, Prosperity Without Growth, that actually efficiencies on their own just aren't going to get us anywhere, because, partly because of that um, rebound effect. So I'll just touch on this one, too, uh, because, uh, oh, hang on, I've got the wrong numbers in there. Apologies for the numbers. That should be, oh, no, no, I've got the right numbers. I've got the right numbers, yeah. So uh, two, three, seven, 
three tons, well, how do you get to that number? That's based on you have a child, they live um, to the UK life expectancy, and they have an absolutely typical carbon lifestyle in an economy that's becoming more efficient in tune with our 2050 goals. And that's what you'll trigger. So I'm not saying don't have kids, but I am just, <laughs> um, I am just saying, uh, you know, there is an inevitable population dimension, very important population dimension to this whole climate change thing. Uh, water, I just bring it up. This is just in terms of the water you drink. I know water is a huge global issue, but um, just a massive difference between that stuff you have out of the bottle and the stuff that comes out of the tap. I mean, this must be one of the, you know, just a f I just put this slide one up because it's such, a great it's such a great opportunity to go and just cut some junk out of our lives that brings us absolutely nothing, whatever. It saves us money. Um, interestingly, the economy might look as though it slows down a bit if we cut out the, uh, if we cut out, um, the bottled water. Um, and on average, we might look a little bit poorer. The G GDP might go down a bit, but we'd all be better off because we're not spending our money on bottled water anymore. So it's a, for me, it's a good illustration of uh, how um, useless GD GDP is as a measure of um, prosperity. Again, Tim Jackson does a much better job than me of, of flushing that out. Very quickly, solar panels are, are worth a look because um, they do give you, yeah, they've got quite a significant embodied energy, embodied carbon to them, but they give you great lifetime savings. Where photovoltaic panels and all sort of micro renewables start getting into trickier water is when you start looking at whether they're a good way of spending your money or not. Um, so, and the answer to that question is that if you're going around with um, a a few tens of thousands of, or 10,000 pounds uh, burning a hole in your pocket and you're wondering what to do with it, and you're feeling as though you need a new status symbol, um, and you're wondering whether to do it, spend it on a car or PV panels, then uh, it's a no-brainer. You you, you've got to get the PV panels. That's a really constructive way of safely disposing of that money that's um, sitting there in your pocket. Um, another perspective on this is to say, well, suppose you've got 10,000 pounds in your pocket, and you want to do the right thing for the low-carbon world. Or supposing you're the government and you've got some money and you want to do the, low the right thing for the low-carbon world, should you spend it on supporting people doing their PV panels? Actually, when you could be uh, investing in offshore wind farms or even more investment in uh, loft insulation or deforest uh, stuff to uh, preserve forests around the world or something like that, you could probably get hundreds of times better bang for your buck. Uh, very quickly, I'd better wrap up, but very quickly, um, a country. The red ones show the consumption footprint and the slightly out of date figures actually, just my estimates of the consumption footprint and the gray ones, the production based footprint, that's the emissions that actually come out of the country, uh, the out of the country itself. So you first, and they say now China's the big, China's overtaken the States now, uh, more recently. But one of the things that's really interesting about this is that the consumption-based footprint in China is a good deal lower, because a lot of that footprint in China is being exported to people like us, um, who are you know, getting our dirty work done for us overseas. And the per capita footprints give you uh, a different story again. Uh, I'd better move on for time, really. Uh, well, I've got to the end. Great, that's it. So, so there it is. It's, uh, so the idea is it's an, uh, it's an early map of um, the carbon footprint of, of everything, uh, and it's just to give us you know, enough that we can be broadly sensible in, in the stuff that we do. Thank you. Mike, I'm sure we'll take, happy to take questions. I have one to start, please. Um, what was the most counterintuitive result that you came up with <laughs> in your analysis to do this book? What surprised you the most? The most? Uh, well, The Red Rose was quite surprising when I first encountered it, I think. Um, uh, yeah. Um, when I first encountered food, I think that was pretty, you know, how big a deal food was. Food. And we all know air freight, is, air, is, air travel is a big deal. Quite how big a deal it is, that surprised me. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was the food. I think food always surprises everybody. You know, I think you use in the book so, something about the carbon footprint of a cup of tea being dominated, for example, by the, the, the carbon cost of making by the milk. By the milk. It. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and that's a yeah. theme. I think through, increasingly a theme throughout the literature on this topic. Yeah. So at the end of this, when you looked at this, you know that the, w that the UK has got to get down to t one, two, 
maximum two and a half tons per person from 15. Did yeah. you feel at the end of it that, that we could do it and still retain roughly the same sort of lifestyle as we have today? Well, it's kind of one step at a time, probably. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know. But I do know that you know, most of us, and definitely me included, there's, a, there's lots of junk in our lifestyles, I think. There are lo loads of things that add absolutely nothing to the quality of our existence whatsoever. We're kind of uh, in the habit of it. Mm. Uh, and if we can find it and root it out, life will just get better. So that's kind of the next step. So it's all about especially finding things that make life, improve the quality of life. Um, right. Without, but, but did you think at the end of it it was going to be possible to get down to two and a half, two tons, 30, 40 years? Yeah, it's very difficult to do now as an individual in the society we've got as it is mm. with you know, the economy set up the way it is. Um, but yes, over time, yeah. Indeed. I mean, yeah. we're not going to be able to buy a new laptop every year. It's going to have to be, have to, these things are going to have to last a lot longer. They're going to have to be made differently, and everything in them is going to have to be recycled and reused. And very little of that's happening yet. Yeah, but all sorts of things will get easier. So the, the electricity that's used to make a laptop will start becoming lower carbon, and all, all kinds of things, you know, and we will get more efficient, and we'll be able to start building things to last long. So all sorts of things will help us as individuals to cut our own, our own mm. footprint down. Mm.